Sweet. So welcome to the San Francisco Dharma Collective. We are making our way through this very beautiful text, No Time to Lose. And this is uh, an original text by Shantideva, 8th century sage. Come on in, make yourself wherever you find a seat. Maybe there you go. And each week, we kind of dive a little deeper into this book. Admittedly, we are still only through chapter two, maybe about a month and a half in. If this is your first time here, no problem. I'll give a little overview of this text and its purpose. And for all of you who are coming a lot, we are going to dive even deeper into our confession tonight. So, <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, so this text is essentially an outline of how we can learn to live in this world, which is on fire with an open heart, and how we do so by both stabilizing our sense of presence, developing a clear mind, and also really tenderizing the heart. And part of tenderizing the heart is seeing clearly the world as it is and being able to take in and be with the suffering that is around us and the suffering that we create. So tonight, in the last number of weeks, we were kind of working on a series of how do we feel at home in more spacious, open awareness. And then the last time that I was here, we started this practice of kind of working the other edge of compassion. And for those of you who are here, you might remember we did these four turnings of the mind, these ways that we really reflect on impermanence and change and how we let that be kind of like the spark or the, the pilot light getting lit of our compassion, just recognizing that this precious human life is so rare and that everything and all the actions we are doing are contributing either to what will support us on our path of awakening or creating further obstacles. And that seeking our joy and happiness in the always shifting experiences of the outer world will necessarily bring us unhappiness. So there's a lot of ways to kind of bring this compassion and some of those phrases that help us land it deeply in the heart are very supportive. But this evening, we're going to <clears throat> move towards compassion a bit tying it in with this idea of confession. So I want to unpack that again. And last time, um, one of our participants here was we had a, a good conversation about confession after the session. It's a pretty loaded word, especially for folks who are coming from certain religious traditions. This idea that we confess, uh, maybe we have an idea that we're, we're pressured to come up with something, an idea that also implies that we can create something that is evil or wrong or like a sin. And there's something so fundamentally different about this perspective of confession. It's built upon the idea that we are already good and that we need to recognize our goodness as fundamental and that will help us see clearly the ways that we fall away. So, um, yeah, I think I was, um, especially yesterday, in thinking about this class, considering the confessions I'd be willing to share with you all, because, you know, you got to lead by example. And I found a real, it was very easy. There's many to come up with. Um, one around clinging and one around aversion, right? And so the idea is that our, our confessions can help us build these essential ingredients of being aware when we are acting outside of alignment then being able to take action to kind of overcome what we have done that might be harmful and also to have deep resolve those are the main ingredients for our confession so the ones that i was um, thinking about is i was teaching last week at a retreat center and i um, which people know esalen which kind of a workshop area and you sit in these wonderful warm baths and you really need a lot of hydration. And I only brought like six hydration packets. And I was sharing my room with one of my best friends um, and really saw the smallness of my own heart and clinging when I looked at my hydration packets and realized 
I could really only offer her one because I was there for five days. And just that sense of like scarcity, like, oh, I don't have enough. I'd like to give her some because she said she's dehydrated, but I need them for myself. It's just so fast, that kind of grasping and that gripping and that sense of, I need mine, there's not enough. And why that is the case, you know, what is the conditioning from our culture? We could go into it forever. But to be able to see that, such a simple example, right? So that's the mindfulness. This is my heart grasping. This is me not actually opening and considering sharing. And I'm not suggesting I should have given all of my hydration packets away and been depleted as I was teaching. But how does that, how do we recognize when the heart starts to close in on itself and not feel the generosity? And then the second part is to remember that kind of clinging and that scarcity that's not me. That's, you know, I'm basically good, as Chogyam Trumpa says. Like, I'm, I'm a good person who has some clinging towards my hydration packets. These are really good. They were lemon lime. They have potassium, magnesium. You know, they're really good. They had, they had some for sale. They weren't quite as good. Um, and then the third is this, like, remedial action, as it's called in this text. What can I do that would really help? And as you all might remember, in the first chapter, one of the things is imagining offering up the goodness to others. Like when we see the beautiful sunlight, we offer that up as kind of reference and rejoicing. And I do think, you know, this idea of offering up what matters to us gets us to the point where we then physically offer up what matters to us as well service and you know not only what we can do for others but things that we cherish can we share them so um needless to say i ordered a lot more hydration packets um not is you know that's a way for me to feel i can give them away freely but also to give them away when i don't have enough right to like give a little more than watching that little kind of squeeze of the heart and then moving forward because the reality is like i'm fine like, it's okay, there's enough. That idea of scarcity doesn't meet the reality. If I truly didn't have enough, it was life-threatening, that's a different story. But this is this habitual, like, oh, I gotta protect mine. And to be able to see that clearly, like, that's the invitation of this confession, right? And that we confess it in groups of fellow travelers on the path is very powerful. And then the, the last step of this is my resolve. I resolve to notice when I feel stingy and I don't want to share, especially in these cases where there's so much. We live in such abundance. So that's a simple one for kind of clinging. And then for aversion, um, one thing I really notice uh, is when I'm in a rush, I get tight. You know, I feel like, mm, like oh, I, I, like I got to get somewhere. And if you're traveling with someone else, for example, um, that becomes this kind of like tightness in you know, their process and what they're doing. So I was going with my fellow teacher, she's packing the car and I'm thinking, oh my God, we gotta, gotta get on the road, there's gonna be traffic on the 101. And I saw my whole body, heart, mind just kind of like tighten and um, not a big deal. But it's just like, you know, it's just this kind of like, I don't like this. So there's my, you know, uh, Lord of the Rings, my precious moment with my hydration packets. And this is my like horror disgust, get that away, I don't want this. You know, kind of two sides of that same coin. And being able to see, again, that habit of, yes, I need to get somewhere. It would be great to miss traffic. Do I need to like shut down and get tight? Because to see clearly that with mindfulness is to see that it really impacts another. With these hydration packets, the impact it was really negligible. My friend didn't know I was withholding. She will if she watches the video. Um, <laughs> but with this, you know, like truly, like it was impacting another. And to really see that, like this was making them feel in a rush and them feel um, ill at ease. But again, I am not a person in a rush, like I have a basic goodness. And Pema Chodron, who writes the secondary text for this book, is so clear that in especially our modern culture where kind of self-criticism and low self-esteem is so high, that that second step of basic goodness is so important. That when we're recognizing and identifying and kind of getting onto ourselves in this confession practice, we really have to connect to basic goodness. And I know in this room we've talked about that a lot, but there's new faces. 
Does anybody have a question about what basic goodness is, that idea, that concept? Yeah. Yeah, what? Where did it? <laughs> Great. <laughs> yes. Any idea, just think, like, when you hear that, when I say we are all basically good, what comes up? Is there any? Well, for me, good is subjective. So okay. I, yeah, I don't actually know what that means. Yeah. Is, is everyone basically good? Great. Is everyone basically good? Yeah, right. Yeah. So the question for folks online was, yeah, what is basic goodness? And is it just subjective? You know, is everyone good? Is Hitler good? And the concept of basic goodness, which interestingly does follow quite well to contemporary psychology, right? So in the, in the Buddhist orientation, when we say basic goodness, there's this very clear understanding that, you know, through all of this clinging and aversion, if you get down to the very pith of it, all of us want to be happy and avoid suffering. And that unites us. Some of us go about that in really unskillful ways. But that there is, like all of us are Buddhas in the making. Which I love, I've, I've mentioned this teacher, Anne Klein, tells this beautiful story of when her guru would meet with all of the students Every time at the end of the teaching, he would said, I salute you, all of you Buddhas in becoming. You know, like, and he really, through pure vision, he saw all of them as Buddhas become. And like, you're smiling, right? That feels good. <laughs> and yeah, so then like the question of people who do great harm, we don't say it's okay because they're a Buddha anyway, but we do recognize that, you know, at some level, there is that goal that's gotten covered up gold that is their heart and it gets covered up by conditioning and pain and reactivity it doesn't mean we allow them to perpetuate harm but it does mean you know it's this ultimate compassion which this text is asking us for and it's interesting in order for us to get to ultimate compassion right think global start local like how could we imagine that for people who are difficult if we can't fathom it for ourselves and a lot of the stuff that I'm like confessing, like I'm, I really wish you didn't know all this about me, <laughs> right? And it's there. And if there's this thing that I'm carrying around kind of in the background, like draining a little bit of my, my energy and attention of, man, I'm, I'm no good. Like, yeah, I do some good things, but I'm no good. And part of like the confession practice is to really like Basic goodness, basic goodness, no matter how I'm acting, no matter how I'm, you know, losing myself, there's good. Not because I did something, but because I am that. And for many of us, it's a theoretical proposition, like, am I good? Well, but we just try it on and we see how it feels. And I do think in meditation, especially tonight, for example, when we're practicing compassion, we start to have a direct experience of it. It's no longer theoretical. Like maybe there's something good. Like we feel that there is basic goodness in us. So wait and see. Yeah, thank you for the question. So then the basic goodness of um, I'm not always in a rush and, and uptight. And then my remedial action. So in this case, because there was another person involved, I could say, I'm so sorry I was rushing you. That wasn't very cool. You know, that's not very nice. That probably didn't feel very good. And you just see there how you're really, yeah, you're both like forging new pathways and, and planting better seeds than what has been done before. So if you're used to like, for example, if you've been in partnership for a while and you're always like uptight when you get in a rush and you know, you're just like, whatever, that's who I am, that's what I do, my partner knows it, it's okay. But it's not really, right? And you're creating this momentum and this energy. And yeah, I mean, your partner, whoever you live with is your teacher, right? I think Goenka said that. So you're really trying over and over to like undo these habitual patterns. It's hardest with the people closest to us. So that apology, especially unexpected, can be such a great way to kind of disrupt that habit. And then the resolve, right? Okay. I gotta cut this out. And I just love that word, like resolve. You know, if we could use the word discipline and most people would be like, oh, I don't like that word. But resolve has this kind of dignity to it, this integrity to it. I see the harm, I'm done with it. I gotta move forward in my life towards becoming a bodhisattva, 
a warrior of compassion. And like, you don't become a warrior by just passively letting all of your habits <laughs> play out, right? You become a warrior by like this, this, this practice. So I, I find it inspiring and I hope that my examples were helpful. Now that you all know, we did the, uh, the communal um, idea of how we have confession. And when we all together here read this beautiful book, The Old Path, White Clouds, the biography of the Buddha, there is many instances in the Sangha of the community of practitioners living with the Buddha. They have the living Buddha as a teacher and they still get into all this drama and like fight with each other and like have bitterness and confession becomes one of the things the Buddha and his closest disciples create in order for practitioners to meet the reality that yeah, we are all Buddhas in the process of awakening, <laughs> but here we are as humans with our clinging and aversion with our little like, oh my God, there's not enough, or I don't want that. And I just, I love this chapter in helping us see more clearly this opportunity to shift that, to see ourselves differently, and also to take a moment and feel compassion for that. Because it, it, it sucks. It sucks to feel scarcity. It sucks to feel aversion. And in <clears throat> our practice tonight, we are, we're actually going to kind of practice compassion for these things that are holding us back, right? Practice compassion for the ways that we're still stuck. So did my examples seed some ideas for you all? Yeah. Um, in, in this context of the Dharma Collective here, the entirely volunteer run space, as many of you know, we really engage in community of practice. And in order to do so, we really have to have this kind of um, this clear intention that everything we're doing here together is practice, not just the sitting, you know, all the ways that we are listening to one another, all the ways that we're communicating to one another. Um, so, you know, bravely, that question was wonderful. And when we are looking at each other, if we can kind of engage that practice of I'm looking at a, a Buddha in becoming who is speaking and watching the mind of judgment and watching the rest. Welcome, you made it. All right, there's room in the front, but everyone thinks it's hot lava. So <laughs> you are welcome if you all want more space to sit up in front. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so with that, we are gonna get started in a practice. If you want to stand up and just stretch one moment, we'll probably sit about 25 minutes together. Oh. Coco gets to stretch too. Yeah. <laughs> And again, for folks who may not have been here in person or online before, we do a guided sit together. We'll do some reflection on that sit, and then we'll make our way through a bit more of this chapter. I'll give us a little extra time in, in the beginning of our practice to really consider this, you know, this guide to the Bodhisattva way of life is essentially us deciding that we're going to commit our life to awakening for the sake of all beings. And I do think that if you made your way into this room, you've probably already committed to that for at least one lifetime, but that's up to you. And together we try to hold this idea that maybe the most important thing we could be doing in our life is forging this heart and mind so that we can be of service to others. So that's where we'll begin. We'll go into a couple phases and stages with guidance. If it is your first time here, 
you know, feel free to make sure you have a sense of this room, right? We have Mace at the door. She is helping us to feel protected and safe here. You know, getting a sense of those around you. It's almost impossible to settle into practice if we don't have some sense that we can be just okay here sitting in this group. So if you want to look around or just even kind of feel the materiality of the chair or the floor beneath you. Taking a moment to really find our posture. Balancing the qualities of vividness and uprightness, almost a lengthening through the spine. And a sense of softness and ease, a porousness through the front of the body. Softening through the forehead and the brow. Softening the eyes, the cheekbones, the jaw. And continuing to invite or sense this melting and softening through the chest and the belly. Feeling this sense of release and softening through the exhale can then invite and balance through the inhale a sense of vividness, clarity, uprightness. Infa inhaling from the sit bones to the crown. And then exhale, releasing that vividness and focus. And inviting a sense of settling into the body, its natural state, by connecting to a sense of stillness throughout the body. Right now, in this moment, there's nowhere we need to go, nothing we need to do. So we can let the body fully inhabit this present moment, saturating it with our attention and awareness. And we settle the mind into its natural state by helping settle the speech 
the inner dialogue, narration. So inviting ourselves to follow the breath, breathing in, feeling the whole body breathing in, breathing out, sensing and feeling the whole body breathing out. In this way, tethering our mind to the breath. And of course, we get carried away. Thoughts, memories, images arise. When we notice this, we just relax and release and return, bringing all of our attention and awareness to the body breathing in and the body breathing out, which doesn't need any concepts or words, just this pure experiencing allowing our mind to settle, allowing the breath to really guide us to focus, stability, presence. Releasing any sense of control, letting the body breathe us. Do not feel discouraged by how many times the mind might slip away. Instead, consider rejoicing when we've recognized. And again, just relaxing and returning. A couple more moments here. Breathing in and feeling the whole body breathe in. Breathing out. Feeling the whole body breathing out. while maintaining some presence of this body awareness and breath. Also allowing a sense of awareness and spaciousness, a natural state of the mind. It could feel almost as though we were gazing at a clear sky, that sense of vast openness.
feeling this intermingling of having settled the body, speech, and mind into their natural states, inviting these qualities of relaxation, vividness, silence, stillness. And from here, we turn towards this beautiful quality of intention and aspiration. In the words of Shantideva, for as long as space remains, so too shall I remain to relieve the suffering of the world. May I be an island for those who need landfall, a lamp for those needing light. May I be a bed for those seeking rest, and for those who are suffering and sick. May I be both medicine and doctor. With arousing bodhicitta, the awakened heart, it can be a feeling, a sense of warmth. We don't need to have a plan. We don't need to fix it or control it. Just to know that this heart is ready and available to meet the suffering. A willingness, a deep care. Taking a moment and considering, is there an intention that is more present here today? There's this broad intention that expands and extends the heart mind inconceivably, this aspiration to alleviate the suffering of all beings. And then there is the aspiration that meets us where we are right here today. So consider that intention, what is needed for the heart and the mind right here today. Allowing this intention or aspiration to be right here with us and then shifting our mind and heart more directly towards compassion. And to prime the pump of compassion, really turning towards our own heart and feel and imagine the presence of unconditioned love. the love which is truly the fabric of who we are and how we have been able to make it to this point. All of the love that has been extended to us by beings in our life, 
by the natural elements of this world supporting us, and by unseen beings. So considering the possibility that this heart and mind and body is already made up of compassion, We could feel or imagine this compassion as a sense of golden light at the heart. Breathing in, we sense this compassion coursing through us and breathing out, we can feel it extending out around us. We can feel and imagine the compassion, not only that we've received in this lifetime, the generosity, the kindness, but also the compassion that we've extended in this lifetime, the care, the love, and feeling the strength of our own capacity. Again, this sense of warmth or light at the heart, giving ourselves this time to reveal the compassion which is always already here within us. from this <clears throat> place of resource, some sense of feeling or imagining of the compassion which is here, we can turn our mind towards this sacred practice of seeing clearly and bringing compassion right there and considering some way in which we find ourselves clinging we see and sense a self-centeredness of how we act or behave with some aspect of our life, our relationship. It could be really simple. This could be clinging on to some idea of who we are, how we want to be. Clinging on to our hopes, not able to rest well, seeking out and expecting from the world goodness, and worrying it won't come. Just taking a moment and considering is there a way that we can see ourselves clearly, some of our clinging, attachment? Not a healthy attachment, but a kind of stickiness or fixation. If no clear example comes to mind, no problem. Recognizing that this 
certainly has been some part of our life. And then feeling into a sense of compassion. Wrapping this experience, which is not who we are, but one of the ways we fall asleep, we get lost. Can we, even in our clear seeing of ways in which we are not acting skillfully, open our heart even wider with compassion? No need to figure out how we will change this or shift it. Just this simple touching into bringing care to the parts of ourself that are still evolving. Considering these simple words or phrases to help our compassion really infuse this clear seeing. May I become more and more free from this clinging and grasping. May my mind become more and more easeful and peaceful. May I find the happiness that is right here within. It's okay if this feels tricky or challenging. It's just a practice. And then we shift and widen our sphere of concern and imagine all the other beings who also struggle with this kind of clinging, who also get caught up and find themselves lost in what they're wanting and seeking maybe impacting others. It's almost unfathomable to imagine how many other beings might be struggling in this way, but we open and widen the heart to include all of them. Feeling that warmth, golden light of compassion and imagining May all beings become more free from this clinging, this attachment and fixation. May all beings experience more calmness and peace in mind. May all beings find that source of genuine happiness within. Checking in and noticing the body and how it feels in the body to allow the heart to open, to direct this compassion. A couple more breaths here at this wide open heart for all beings, which includes us, to be more free, more peaceful, more connected to their true nature of joy, contentment, ease.
releasing any image or word and allowing ourselves to rest in this mind and heart and body of compassion. Feeling the compassion could be not only within us, but all around us, permeating our awareness. A couple more moments here, receiving any nourishment of this mind, heart, and body of compassion, resting in the greater field of awareness of compassion. Reconnecting to the body and the breath. Feeling the presence of the body here in this room. Connected to other beings here in this room and online. And as much as possible, maintaining some presence and compassionate awareness even when the bell rings. Thank you for your practice. So for our friends in the room, it'd be great if you don't mind using that mic so friends online can hear. And for friends online, I'll keep an eye out for your little yellow hands or however you raise your hand. I would love to hear any questions or reflections on that practice. For folks who've been coming the last number of weeks, you know, we've been really weaving this compassion as directed with a target and then compassion as awareness. We continue to do that in this practice. Um, and tricky to do towards ourself when really seeing ourselves clearly in that way. So yeah, any <clears throat> questions, reflections? 
For sure, your question or reflection will be of benefit to others. So it's a Bodhisattva activity, just for the record. Yes, Jimmy. I really, really appreciated the way that you led that meditation, settling us first, and then bringing us into that real, you know, basic heartfelt compassion that I felt real cradled in. Mm. Um, and it allowed me when the prompt was to explore that my areas of clinging and craving, um, to be able to do that with a feeling of, of, of safety and to be able to to bring compassion to that investigation hmm. because it was it's one thing to to recognize my clinging and craving it's a whole other thing to have compassion for yeah. it um because usually it's met with bad boy right you know and 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 i'm it's it's that's not helpful um, it doesn't allow me to really experience it in a full way that it, with, with the compassion, it allows me to experience it with dignity mm. rather than being disgusted by right. it. And, um, and I can, it, it, it can have its, it's, it's, lifespan and fade yeah yeah and that and then when you called on us to come back from that and i i really felt my clinging and craving in a visceral sort mm -hmm. of way and just despite the, the the compassion that was there along with the compassion that was there and then when you called on us to let that vision go it went like that mm -hmm. and i was like bathed in that that compassion mm. and it felt really it felt like basic goodness yeah thank you so much yeah and i know you know we've talked about before that not only like bad boy but you've been practicing what for all these years and still you know it's like there can be so much of that kind of blowback when we start to you know pay attention to these ways that we are still on the path of awakening <laughs> so humbly right yeah yeah decades decades and still i want my hydration packets for myself um very very humbling and you're you know i want to read one passage here that you kind of are beautifully describing. Um, instead of condemning ourselves, we can connect with the open-hearted tenderness of regret. Thus, the habits of self-deception and guilt have a chance to wither away. This is the essential point of the practice of, compassion, of confession. What's that phrase that Pema uses in that first um, of the four confessions, seeing it with the recognition of, yeah, recognition of misdeeds with positive sadness. Positive sadness. Yeah, right. healthy remorse. Yeah, and what you're describing in a way is also moving from shame to guilt, right? The shame of like, oh, I'm just bad, and the guilt of like, all right, let's pull it together. This is not right. How can I do this? But I like the healthy remorse and this open-hearted tenderness of regret so beautiful you can really kind of hear her teacher chogyam in that um too thank you yeah anybody else question reflection hi. comment confusion yes hi elizabeth nice to see you see you um so you know self-compassion um i think i've mentioned before is a real struggle for me, whenever, whenever we have to, whenever we're doing a meditation, 
um, around it. My brain is very, very busy <laughs> going <laughs> anywhere, but there. Um, yeah. And so I like one, I always appreciate um, your words really help pull me back. Um, and the, the, when I was thinking, when I, as I was um, on the journey, um, the, the clinging that I really, um, that really became clear that I needed to work on was um, to identity, which is transient. And, yeah. uh, you know, especially when you have had an identity that felt good on you, like yeah. putting that on and, and you feel like yourself and you're comfortable and, and then it changes because, you know, <sighs> that's the nature of things. Um, yeah. And, and how one of the, the things that, that you have taught over and over again, and, um, and that Pema and other, um, um, teachers also teach are, is the, the importance of, of allowing all of it. Yeah. Um, and that you can know that the identity is transient and mm. grief for the loss of that identity that you felt so comfortable in yeah you know and compassion for yourself in um processing that yeah and then you know there's also for me what became um evident was there was a a compassion of what i'm trying to think of the best words there were there were parts of me openness um that were more accessible and available to share because mm. of being so comfortable in the identity mm. uh, that I would like, like my goal would be to find ways to bring that back. Mm, beautiful. But yeah. What came to mind was an experience where um, um, this is at a preschool. I was another, I was a parent uh, at a cooperative preschool and um, one of the um, grandmothers who was active there lost her husband in his sleep. He um, mm -hmm. had immigrated not long ago but prior. They had immigrated from India. They were practicing Hindus. And um, when I hugged her and I felt my entire being open to her and I honestly felt felt like I was a conduit for the healing energy of the spaciousness around us mm. to her. And to me, the most remarkable part actually wasn't even that particular feeling. It was that she recognized it, that we had mm. the same experience in that, that it was a prolonged hug. Um, and, it was and a really good hug. It was a really good hug. And it was, it was a very profound experience for both of us. And, and I call that, like, as I was recalling that when I was, you know, going through this, this journey with you, um, I felt like that was the best example that I've ever experienced of that, um, that path to true compassion and mm. spaciousness that I have yeah. experienced. Yeah, I, I think that's I think that's really interesting. And thank you for sharing it. I think it's um, what's there's two things there I want to highlight. Like one is it's really beneficial for us to remember and recollect even at the end of every day or every week when we are naturally in the flow of compassion, because we are a lot. Actually, it might not be that kind of huge experience which sounds like in in that case you know so memorable maybe after many years but the are very often in the flow of compassion and it's fully in the body right yes there is concept and ideas but there is this full embodied piece and then the other piece i want to highlight is there is also a compassion that exists without even any target so that might be in in this case if you know after the hug there was you know, just this ongoing sense of enduring care for everyone and all beings. And it's interesting because like a single person can kind of like catalyze that, you know, like you start the flame and the fire, but then it's just burning around us and we don't need to even have a single target for it. It just is radiating. We were talking 
in the last time here together about being in the presence of beings who they've cultivated compassion to the point where it is just radiating out and you come into contact and you know there's just it's so clear um, and that being such an inspiration so you don't have to go through the there is suffering i care about the suffering i'm extending my care it's just this ongoing field so that's a good aspiration thank you so much thank you yeah maybe one more question or comment yes please Shane. thanks um so i'm not following this maybe as closely as other people are um, great um so i remember when we first started with this material when we went over the, the boat of Safi Val. It sounded like a wow big to-do list liberation of all beings through all time like that's a lot um and you kind of said like look at it as like a stance you're taking in your life yes right so what's kind of a version of that to, to this to the compassion and all that kind mm -hmm. of a, break it down that easily wait maybe. wait you sounded like you understand it completely so what's the question <laughs> uh i mean to me the the idea of a stance was like a very simple way to sum up the commitment that you're trying to make oh right? okay um so I wonder if there's a similar easy way to sum up what we're trying to do tonight. You mean the confession? The confession, right. So if we think of the stance as like the, that is the flowering tree of what we're doing. This is like fertilizer and pruning. So for us to be in this stance, or like I'm saying, this kind of, you know, you're, you imagine almost that you're like a lamp and you're just radiating compassion. That doesn't just happen. A lot of the things we need to do, it's like that famous, I think it's Rumi, but it might be Hafez's quote of yours is not to seek to, for love. Yours is to seek all the obstacles between you and love and destroy them. So one of the things that's between us and an ongoing open state of compassion is our clinging and aversion. You know, we all have this capacity to be these beautiful beings of compassion, but we just get caught up in self grasping. It's just the simple truth. Right? We forget that we're connected to everyone, and we forget, as we've been talking about here, that even if all you want is hedonistic pleasure and joy, you're like, actually, what I want in life is to be happy, and I want happiness for me. Like, we still need life's purpose is being of service for others and showing up. Like, happiness translates very easily in positive psychology to connection, positivity, resilience, these qualities that include our ability to relate to others in a meaningful way. So there's, you know, the way that we get to this stance of compassion is by kind of polishing the inner lens, you know, these two aspects in, in this text and many of kind of tenderizing the heart with compassion and also stabilizing the mind so that we can have, we can see more clearly what's happening. Thank you. Sorry, I wish it was easier. It's just like, just take that stance, like, you know, <laughs> like it would be like this, right? <laughs> but it actually, you know, it does take this ongoing work, but it's a perfect question, a good one to ask because, um, you know, it is a big deal, this Bodhisattva vow. And I just don't think there's another sane alternative. You know, there's no other way to, like we can each day kind of go through our to-do list and then do the next thing and the next thing. But if you take even a moment to look around and think, how do I want to be in the world? Like there's not that many options that make sense that are sustainable other than, you know, how can I, you know, train this heart and mind so that I can meet the reality of suffering. And it's not just in 2024, like the reality of suffering that, we are born, we get sick, if we're lucky, we get old, and we certainly die. That's it. So how do we learn how to be in this heart, mind, and body with that reality? Satisfying? Unsatisfying? Okay. Keep it percolating and let me know. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Any? Yes, please. Will you remind me of your name again? Paul. Paul, that's right. Good name. My dad's it's, name. So it's I'm what it is. Fan. Yeah. Um, so th this phrase or concept of healthy remorse, I kind of like it. Yeah. And m my question is, I'm, I know there's this concept of dukkha, which I've kind of understood to mean some variation on regret, things mm. that we have either done or failed to do um, that 
eat at us and yes. leave us feeling profoundly dissatisfied. Yes. So I'm just would appreciate your thoughts on the relationship between this kind of healthy remorse because oh, remorse and regret they seem yeah. kind of like cousins like yeah. they're, they're, right. they're related uh and which seems restorative and positive yeah uh and dukkha which is not it my initial thought and, and then i'll leave it to you is that the difference between maybe healthy remorse and dukkha the kind of unhealthy regret <laughs> yeah um maybe self-compassion mm. is that if you can look at the things that you did or didn't do in your life that you wish you had done otherwise mm. with an element of self-compassion mm. that it can be kind of healthy remorse mm. but when you look at them without self-compassion it's it's just beating yourself up and dukkha and an unhappiness yeah but yeah beautiful and i i love this inquiry and i don't pretend that i'm going to give you like the answer you know i think it's a interesting philosophical one and you know dukkha and i i love the the translation of unsatisfactoriness i think that's like such a good one because we experience it so much Many of us are like, suffering? Like, well, I mean, have you seen the news? I'm not suffering. Suffering is happening many other parts of the world. And we don't feel like that relates to us. But when we think of that feeling of unsatisfactoriness, like that, we can, who can relate to that? Things being unsatisfactory. Like, I wish it were different. I wish it were different. And, you know, I see what you're saying of the difference between kind of a regret or remorse is this ability to um, have compassion. And I think there might be an, another layer there where with that unsatisfactoriness, it's very self-centered, right? It's not working for me. And we're not seeing clearly that it's probably not about us, right? A lot of that suffering is like, um, trying to, yeah, like why, why didn't I get that job? Like, I really need it right now. Like, I haven't had a job in six months, and I really need to pay the rent, and I'm the right person. And, you know, we can create a lot of suffering around something that is, that's true. Like, we didn't get a job. It's not like we're making it up. But we're wrapping around it a self-oriented narrative. You know, we're becoming kind of like the, the grand protagonist in the story that is just life on Earth. So there's a self-centered fixation with dukkha. And interestingly, because kind of what you're suggesting is, can self-compassion pierce that? And I had a, um, I have a friend who I, I remember at least 10 or 11 years ago, the first time she said to me, you know, sometimes I worry that self-compassion might make people self-obsessed or like self-cherishing or, you know, and I was, it blew me away because I was like, oh, self-compassion is always good. We need it all the time. But there can be a way that self-compassion is also self-referential. Um, and part of what makes healthy remorse so helpful is that like clear seeing of the impact we're having on others. And it kind of puts us in, in our right place. It doesn't try to make us the center of this narrative and story. So I think there's both. And self-compassion practice well, I mean, it's so incredibly beautiful. I would, if I were the, you know, president of the universe or whatever that would be, I would absolutely have every school, every workplace and every person be practicing it, but practicing it with a clear objective that you're doing this in order to be more compassionate towards others, not as its own kind of um, benefit. So, yeah, but I think it's a great question. And I think there's just something about rumination, like we can definitely have positive rumination and really go over, turn over and over in our mind, things that are going well and that are enjoyable. And that could create a kind of self-centered um, suffering. But generally, we ruminate over and over about what's going wrong, <laughs> too. And that, I feel like, is really the, the dukkha, that sense of, um, oh, this is so bad, and why is it so bad, and it keeps being so bad. It's just that, it's like that turning over and over, like we can't let it go. We can't just... Um, see that it too will change.
like everything. So there's that wisdom piece in it, and that also like, what is our role? What's the space of who we are in it? Thank you so much. So I wanna, um, yeah, I wanna share a couple of the verses here. So for folks who've been here, you know that there are these verses that Shanti Deva wrote in the eighth century, and then there's beautiful commentary by Pema Chodron. Um, and I'll start off with a little commentary, which is uh, Pema talking about her teacher, Trungpa Rinpoche. He said that the Tibetan word um, for confession is dikpa, and that he translated as neurotic crimes. And that choosing a psychological, you know, interpretation instead of, you know, something that you've done wrong, you know, you're, what are you confessing for? It's your neurotic crimes. Uh, and that words that I identify us as fundamentally marred are not helpful. And if we can have this idea of a neurotic crime instead of like, we are sinners, for example, we'll feel inspired to connect with our strength and goodness. So these are the, here are a couple stanzas from Shanti Deva. And again, for if you haven't heard this before, Shanti Deva is really into high drama. He wants to both, you know, talk about the beauty of bodhicitta and also like the hell <laughs> of being stuck in our own self-centered clinging and grasping. So he says, this is his chat, you know, his confession area. Before my evil has been cleansed away, it may be that my death will come to me. And so that come what may, I might be freed. I pray you quickly grant me your protection. The wanton Lord of death, we cannot predict and life's tasks done or still to do, we cannot stay. And whether ill or well, we cannot trust our lives, our fleeting momentary lives. And we must pass away, forsaking all. But I, devoid of understanding, have forsake of friend and foe alike, provoked and brought about so many evils. My enemies at length will cease to be. My friends and I myself will cease to be and all is likewise destined for destruction. All that I possess and use is like the fleeting vision of a dream. It, fail, it fades into the realms of memory and fading will be seen no more. And all of these stanzas, you know, they're intended to remind us that he, what he's calling the wanton Lord of death, that we have no idea when we're going to die. We have no idea if we get to finish what we're working on right now or otherwise, but that we are certain that all of us, all of our enemies and all of our friends, we will all die. And that kind of this preoccupation with holding close those we care for and pushing away those we don't like, there's like no point. Because at the end, when death comes, it doesn't matter how closely you held or how tight or intensely you pushed. Because at length, you know, my enemies at length will cease to be, as will my friends and myself. And this beautiful analogy that's used so commonly um, in Buddhism that, you know, everything that we are kind of obsessed with and everything that we are often donating all of our mental energy towards, it's like a dream, you know, in that this idea when we're dreaming, we have no idea that we're in a world of fantasy. Likewise, many of us, as we're daydreaming throughout the day, with like imagining and clinging onto the things that we love and ruminating about the things we don't like, we're dreaming. We're not in the present moment, right? We're not with who we're with. We're not doing what we're doing. We're lost in that dream. So the invitation here um, is to really see clearly to be in this present life and like dedicating oneself towards these practices. He says, um, the thought never came to my mind that I too am a brief and passing thing. And so through hatred, lust and ignorance, I've been the cause of many evils. Never halting night or day, my life is slipping, slipping by and nothing that has passed can be regained. And what but death could be my destiny? And so there's this kind of invocation and the way Pema um, describes it here. She says, these verses address the essential groundlessness of our experience. If we're trying to ignore the truth of death, 
we might find ourselves in a kind of panic. Any degree of attention to our experience will easily convince us that life is slipping away. Getting older is a good motivation for not wasting this precious life. Um, so there's, you know, again, in his, in his invitation here and what he is trying to model for all of us is how do we be so clear and so honest about the ways we get caught up in the day to day kind of um, pushing and pulling, right? If we just think about even a single day's worth of mental activity, like how much of it is energizing compassion, goodness, kindness, versus how much of it is energizing, I want to be better than that person, or I want that person to be farther from me, or how can I get a little more, like this kind of exchange of desire and aversion, like so much of our mental energy. Even just in, you know, I was at the farmer's market, which is you know, it's such a blessing, like really, like I get to be at the farmer's market. Um, and now I'm coming towards the completion of a almost two month personal sabbatical. Like I could go to the farmer's market at 3 p.m., y'all. Like that is awesome. And then, but they're still like, oh, is that person going to get that better basket of berries than me, right? Like it's just amazing where the mind can go. And if we're not really bringing mindfulness to it, instead of just, wow, look at these strawberries and like, look at these beings and look at, you know, there's just so much for us to be present with our experience that'll help us actually be aware of what's happening in other people, to exchange like a kind smile, to just move through the world in a way that isn't causing harm. But even those little thoughts, those little tendencies towards clinging, um, he's saying that these are kind of planting all the seeds that will lead us towards finding ourselves surprised at death, that we have done no work towards transforming our minds. Instead, we've just been energizing these pathways which he calls evil, but Pema, Pema says, um, you know, this word evil can, can really be misunderstood and she loves the neurotic crimes instead. So um, she, she tells a sweet story about taking her children to see the 16th Karmapa um, and asking the Karmapa to say something uh, that didn't require any understanding of the Dharma to her children so they could understand and benefit. And the Karmapa says, you're going to die. <laughs> and when you do, you will take nothing with you but your state of mind. And it's like it, right? Like, why are we focused on the berries and the identities and like all that stuff? Like, there's still so much in this, this pap the way that she describes this chapter is still preparing the ground, like just getting us ready um, for the work ahead. Okay, any questions? So far, any comments on this drama of Shanti Deva here? I have a comment. Great. Thanks, Grace. So I was thinking about buying a car really recently, but after hearing you say this, I'm thinking like, what material do I need if I'm not going to have it when I die? <laughs> but I don't have a car, so maybe I kind of want a car. <laughs> so it's hard to, to balance these two things. Yeah. What do you think? Um, I'm really debating it still. I have no idea. I'm going to yeah. wait to see if my future plans require it. But if yeah. I don't, then I'm not going to bother. Yeah. It. It's two really different directions. Yes. And, and the, there can be a risk a little bit in Buddhism. And, um, you know, we see this in the um, old path white clouds in the traditional story of the Buddha, that when we think about the reality of death, it can turn towards nihilism, right? And then really good black metal. You know, um, uh, great. Like this idea can become a little bit of a fixation and it can be hard for us to enjoy the present moment. So there's just this balance that we have to have when we really embrace and recognize impermanence and change. But also, yeah, like we are here, we have things to do here and they're important and they might require a car. But I think the invitation is to not get so caught up in excess that we forget, you know, this opportunity of this precious human life to transform our heart and mind. It's really, you know, an amazing opportunity. And I know there's a number of people here who've been practicing for years, maybe decades, and um, you definitely have to see it for yourself, but it really does transform your life. It really does. And it's, it's worth exploring whether that's true. 
Um, and that's, I think, the invitation here with Shantideva and, and with all these teachings is what is absolutely needed in order to lead a life that is of benefit and that is skillful. And then when are we just indulging and escaping through material and outside sources? So I hope that helps. Middle way, right? So don't go, don't go, maybe not the Rolls Royce, not the BMWs, mm -hmm. or unless, you know, like taking it all into account of um, how we can also support this, this environment that we live in, our one planet. So then a lot of these next phrases kind of continue on this theme of what Pema Chodron describes that each day we're either strengthening or weakening our, na our negative patterns. Karma is not punishment, it's the consequences we're temporarily stuck with. We can undo it by following the path. And while death indeed can be terrifying, it also presents an opportunity for enlightenment. It depends on what we cultivate during our lifetimes. In preparing for death, it's extremely help to helpful to cultivate familiarity with bodhicitta and the unconditional openness of our mind. And you know, we've again talked about this sometimes here, but meditation is not only a great way to be able to live your life with more authenticity and presence and compassion, it's a great way to prepare for death, which is inevitable, right? And our own death and others' death. And to have that, you know, kind of clear turning towards the difficulty, like the ultimate difficulty, like what are we afraid of? Getting old, getting sick, well, dying, right? Like that's the big fear. And to really head on, um, move towards what she's describing here, that sense of groundlessness, and groundlessness is one of those words that's often used in Buddhism and that can be kind of confusing. Like, what does that mean? Like, what is groundlessness? It gives us, you know, an opportunity to really almost like to renew our contract with our life each day. So we could imagine at the end of each evening, um, I know Katie, you were saying for a while, you're doing those prayers, right? Yeah, with the, with like, you know, wow, this day wasn't certain that I would have it, and I did. I might not wake up tomorrow. I hope if I do, it will be to be of benefit. To really like, the like groundlessness is shaking this fundamental delusion that everything's gonna be okay, <laughs> right? Which we need a little of to like function in our life, but we also need a little of that kind of um, infusion of groundlessness to shake us out of habitual patterns, and especially those ones that get us all bound up and thinking about ourselves and not developing our heart of compassion. And so groundlessness, it sounds again very, you know, wow, it's, I'm gonna experience groundlessness. It's a huge, amazing experience. We can do it in any moment, in any experience. It does, I will say, if you're practicing on retreat and you start to have more and more experiences of groundlessness, that shift back to relative reality in the world can be a bit jarring um, and like bizarre, but mostly groundlessness it really helps with like levity and appreciation. Um, and the way that, you know, Pema is, is kind of supporting Shantideva's teachings here is that we use this life as a training ground for death and we use death as a training ground for life, right? Like really imagining that reality that we will, of course, all of us die. And that at the time of death, if we're lucky enough to know we are dying, that having compassion and clarity of mind will be liberating. In the Tibetan book of, of death or dying that some of you may be familiar with, it's a very clear articulation of these different phases of the mind and consciousness. And much like dreaming, we don't realize that we're no longer in our body. And that if we train ourselves through meditation to feel at ease in these states of kind of awareness and spaciousness, there's less agitation, there's less fear when actually we are leaving the body. This is not uh, in contemporary science kind of proven, but if you read it, there is a lot of compelling illustrative descriptions of it. And because it is such good training for life too, it's just an added benefit. 
And I think this idea of learning how to not only be in our waking states more compassionate, present, and aware, how to be in our dreaming states more compassionate, present, and aware, also that leads to being in our dying states more present, compassionate, and aware. It's a good deal, right? Three for one. <laughs> so I, f I find it inspiring, that bigger view. She says, for those who spend their lives learning to relax with groundlessness, death is liberating. But if we live our lives trying to hold on to this brief and transient existence, we're going to be scared, very scared. Death is the ultimate unknown we are forever avoiding. It's the ultimate groundlessness that we try to escape. But if we learn to relax with uncertainty and insecurity, then death is a support for joy. Yeah, hard. <laughs> hard to do. Um, and so in this next part of the chapter here, what we're really kind of moving towards is, so we've gone through the very first part of this chapter was that offering up, right? Like allowing the heart to start to feel more open and caring and being able to really, in everything we see of beauty, imagine sharing it with all beings. That's this kind of offering phase. And then the confession phase of like really seeing clearly the ways we're being held back. And the last part of this chapter, which we'll move on to next week, is really thinking about where do we take refuge? Where are we currently kind of cultivating these habits of mind and heart that can give us a sense of true refuge? And, you know, spoiler alert, it's the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha that's suggested. And then the next chapter, it's actually, I shouldn't say this, but it is, it's my favorite chapter in the book. Just so much jewels in this next chapter coming. It's really interesting. It's, it's still this part of the very first phase is preparing the ground and illustrating bodhicitta. But I think it gives such clear insights into the ways that we can kind of cut through these habits of mind and these really um, beautiful analogies of the ways that we engage in self-deception. We don't even see we're in a habit of mind. We're just like continuing to do the same thing day in and day out. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's worthwhile always taking the bigger view with this book, which is this book is intended as very clear guidance of how to become a warrior of compassion not just how to practice compassion so we feel okay, but how to use like all of the 999 arms of compassion, right? So that we can meet whatever arises. And I am just so grateful to all of you who are in here and who have interest in this because we really need it, you know? All of us need it. And each person here, even if there's like this glimmer of like, okay, I sense that, I know that, I feel that. Like each of us influence others and really the whole thing starts moving and, and shifting. And by no means is this the only handbook or guide for becoming a compassion warrior. It's just one of the many ways that people train, you know, either deliberately or um, through life experience. But the goal is just getting so clear on the fact that all of us are connected, all of this is impermanent, and the only thing that makes sense is opening our heart wider and wider. So let's dedicate our practice together, meaning using this opportunity to really reflect on how we might offer up this energy of this evening together this offering is such a beautiful gesture. It's in some ways the quintessential gesture of compassion to offer up any goodness of this evening. So taking a moment and feeling the body. And sensing whether there's some goodness maybe a reflection or insight, maybe just some greater sense of availability or openness. 
whatever has been generated, we imagine that we could offer this and send it out. And so if it feels comfortable placing the hands together in front of the heart as a gesture of offering, and dedicating this time and effort together that all beings could be free from inner and outer hearts, that all beings could know peace and ease, that each and every being of all time could be truly free. Such a treat to be here with you all. And um, yeah, I see some new faces, so definitely welcome, folks. We have some really exciting stuff this weekend, like some big deal stuff. And we're actually really lucky because we have one of our teachers for this weekend who's here. And I was going to go on and um, talk all about it, but I will just say a couple of things, which is I've gotten to um, be a Dharma sister with Alejandra for many years and also gotten to witness her expertise in what she's offering and we are so lucky and i wonder would you be okay to say a couple words okay could someone hand the mic to alejandra hello everyone eve has told me about this wonderful sangha oh it's so beautiful to be here with mm. all of you um thank you so on uh sunday Sunday, mm -hmm. yes, we will start a series of monthly workshops on uh, language alchemy. Language alchemy is three things. It is first and foremost, an awareness practice. Secondly, it's a conscious communication approach. And thirdly, it's a form of evolutionary activism. Mm. And I am going to be teaching how to show up in the world with that self-compassion, with that compassion for others, we are going to talk about healthy remorse and, <laughs> and uh, restorative practices in our closest relationships and with one another through conscious communication. It's uh, every, every month it will be on a different date, but it will be on a weekend, either a Saturday or a Sunday. We start this Sunday, 10 to 12 Pacific time. And uh, when we are spiritual practitioners, sometimes, even though like tonight we have referenced so much about communication i was like that's communication and that's communication but sometimes we don't work specifically with a focus on conscious communication how do we communicate with our bodies how do we communicate with ourselves in our internal dialogue how do we bring equity and love mm. and equality to our closest relationships how are we perhaps unknowingly perpetuating systems of oppression mm. uh, within ourselves and with others unless we dedicate some focus and practice to the exploration and the awareness of that sometimes we continue bringing more suffering to the world even when we have been deep spiritual practitioners mm. so that's what we're going to work on yes 